Welcome to Gray Area, a show about justice and redemption. I'm Julie Reynolds Martinez. This is the story of Lou Hammond. Lou started out like lots of kids, playing little league with neighbors and classmates, getting good grades, and attending summer school just because he wanted to. But by the time he was a teenager, Lou was pursuing a career as a criminal. He built a life around becoming the worst of the worst. His goal was to keep up with other young men who committed multiple homicides. The law caught up with him, of course, and he wound up with a life sentence in a supermax prison. That's not the end of Lou's story, though. Something unexpected happened inside that remote prison's walls that made Lou change for good. Okay. I grew up in South Stockton. I lived there my whole life. Hadn't really traveled anywhere. Uh, had never went outside of my neighborhood. The South Side is where I grew up. I'm 46 now. There's only two streets I've ever lived on. Second Street or Fourth Street. Both on the South Side. All my memories come from those streets. We had a big family. We lived with my grandmother. A lot of aunts in the house. It was really tight-knit. I didn't know I was poor until I found out later we were poor because of the food, the love, and everything that was in the house. My mom's been in the military. She retired over 30 years in the military. Yeah, hard worker. I used to go to her camps, Camp Pendleton and Fort Bragg, and you know they would do trainings, right? Like three months or six months out of a year, she was active duty, and she would take us. And so I'd hear them marching. It, all their stuff rhymed. And, and it stood out. My father was a bartender in a bar that a lot of gang members frequented. Dad used drugs, you know, uh, alcohol, hard drugs, and really wasn't there. His dad's closest friend was a high-ranking gang member, and Lou thought if he could somehow be like that friend, he might win his father's affection. I, I loved him, missed him, and since I didn't know him, instead of me wanting to be like my father, I wanted to be like the man that I knew that he loved. And so I said, okay, well, this is on my plate, you know. So one day uh, I remember really vividly, we were on 2nd Street and there was uh, 50 to 60 young men and they're in the alley and they're drinking and they're and they're partying, you know, they're you know, the tank tops, the blue jeans and the white shirts and there's some big boys, you know, I mean big like muscular. None of them were really old enough to hit jail, maybe just a few. And as I seen these sixty guys caught my attention in the alley, I seen this one guy barking orders. As he's barking, they're looking and they're listening and, and he was he was five two. Joe. And I know him because I know his brothers, me and his brothers, uh, Daniel, rest in peace. They were like my best friends. So I knew that that was their brother, but I didn't know that he had this kind of authority. So I see him barking these orders, and he's looking up, and they're looking down at him, and they're hanging on every word. This guy got that kind of power. And so when I seen that, I said, that's what I want. That's who I want to be, basically. I found out that Joe was very violent. Violent was what gave him his position and power, but his reputation of pain is what created all of that. And he was known to hurt a lot of people. You know, at the time, there wasn't a lot of guns. You know, that we're talking early 80s. And most you'd have, which I think is violent, is the carjack. Oh, those things, they were cracking heads open because very few had guns. Shooting people. Now, shooting people stands out because there's not no shooting. So I said, I want to be Joe. When I seen Joe, I was 12 years old, and uh, I had already followed them in the sense of they sniff gas, they sniff paint. We used to walk into a, a house, right, like in the backyard, there'd be a garage. Picture 20 guys, no women, oldies playing, a strobe light, and we all have a gallon of milk with about five cents of gas in each gallon and a rag covering it and everyone's just 
for hours. Huffing. People seeing things, they start fighting. You lose yourself. It steals all oxygen from your brain. It's, it's a hallucinogenic on a whole nother level. And we're doing it for hours. Now my grandmother, the women in my life I would had were loving, caring, always present. The men were not. So when it got too late, Louis, I get that call. We came running, you know. Well, a lot of my other friends, they didn't get that call. So they continued to sniff that gas and it probably saved me. What did you do? Oh, I was working on a mini bike. You know, I'd say something like that because I smell like gas. And so a lot of them lost their minds. I grew up Catholic. The women in my life kept taking me to church. So when I'm with women, I'm with the church. When I'm with men, I'm with the gangs or the culture. And, and I more gravitated towards the men because you know I saw myself in them or what I wanted to be. Well, one time we were going to my aunt's. Christmas was probably in about a week. I'm 12, my sister's 10. And my sister was in a play where she had this role and she really loved it. I don't think she did much but sing or something, but she had this dress, a really pretty blue dress. And so she wanted her hair to get done prior to. And we went to my aunt's house and my sister was getting her hair done. And when we were leaving about 10.30, maybe at night, and we were going home, my mom was driving, my brother was sitting behind her, my sister was sitting passenger, I was sitting behind her. And we were about maybe two blocks away from our house on a turnpike on the side of the freeway. And I see this this big big Cadillac. I mean, it's it's flying down the street, swerving lanes, you know. And you could see it's almost like a boat. You know how Cadillacs are like they they go down and they come up and they go down and they come up. My mom swings towards the curb, and at the same time, this car is just coming so fast, and it hits us. And we were in a really small car. And as soon as it hits us, I don't remember anything else. I was ejected from the car. My sister was ejected from the car. Uh, my brother and my mom were hurt, but they were, they were in the car. Well, my sister ended up um, breaking the windshield with her head, and she was thrown about she was thrown pretty far into the side of the freeway. As I said, I, I couldn't see this. I just heard the screaming and the crying. Uh, my leg was broken uh, at my ankle, my knee, and they, they actually said I would never walk. That, it, was, it was really bad. Uh, I wake up in the hospital, and I remember waking up, and I see my mom crying. She's standing over me with my auntie, and she's crying. And I'm like, what is this, a funeral? It's my comment. You know, 12 years old. They didn't say nothing. And then uh, finally my mom came in, and she said, you know, your sister has brain damage, and she's not going to make it. So I was like, what? You know, I didn't know that had, what had happened. And I had learned later about, you know, her uh, being thrown from the car. And... So I asked if I could see her. They uh, wheeled me in to her room. Uh, she she was in a regular sized bed, but it, she looked her really small, you know, in the middle, and her head was wrapped. And she looked peaceful. And she looked like she was asleep. And I said goodbye to her, and they pulled the plug, and she died. Uh, was a drunk driver, and um, you know later in time we found out he got like a year for drunk driving. So when I went home in a wheelchair, I remember seeing my mom. This was probably the strongest lady I knew, and she was going crazy. She was losing her mind because she couldn't. Uh, she couldn't process 
I was losing my sister. And so I see my mom. Um, she went and take a bath. She went and wash herself. My aunts were like taking care of her. And she had this doll uh, that was my sister's. And she wouldn't let it go. And, and in time, I said, you know, this is the strongest person I know. And this is what's happened to her. Uh, I felt a lot of guilt. I felt a lot of shame. Uh, because my sister was, uh, she was younger than me. And I felt that uh, that I was already had one because I had already lived two years longer than her. And I felt that uh, she sacrificed her life for mine because she went through the windshield. And whoever would have went through it first was the one who was going to get the brain damage because I came right behind her. It was already broken. And so I tried to process that and uh, it was hard. I leaned on my faith. But seeing my mom that way, uh, it shook me, you know, because that's all I knew. She was strong. You know, she was the, the woman of the house. And I felt like I let them down. Uh, there was a lot of pain in my heart. And uh, I said uh, two things. Never again am I going to not be in front of my family. And that I would make sure that people paid they would feel this pain that I felt and that stood with me my whole life I was in summer school and I was just there to learn more I didn't I had not uh, I wasn't failing any classes it was just to get ahead and we were at a school that was on the east side and that's not the side that I'm from I knew that that I didn't know the people out there and my brother boo uh, he was processing his stuff his own way, I guess. And I remember coming outside and I saw like six guys and they were all around him and they were gonna fight. Well, they were gonna jump on him actually. And I remember being really scared when I saw that. And one guy hit him, he, he hit him from the side where he couldn't see. And, and my fear, cause I know what it was, I distanced myself from him, from my brother of the six guys i was like ooh, that's what i did i went ooh, like you you did that you know kind of in that sense and as soon as i did it my brother turned and he didn't look at the kind of kid he looked at me like, like you, you just, you left me. I was just look, and as soon as he looked at me that way, I regret, I regretted it. And I, I was like, damn, I should have got my ass whipped too, you know. And then I re remembered my sister. I said, damn, I fucked up. And so I started to uh, say to myself, uh, this ain't gonna happen. Um, be in the front. I'm going to make sure that uh, if someone comes, I'll take whatever. I will never leave you. They're going to pay for hurting you. And uh, over time, that became true. The, the, a lot of people did pay. I, I, I was very quick to respond overly, overly aggressive. I carried guns so that I can respond overly aggressive. And uh, there was one thing that I was always comfortable in, and it was when I was responding that way for my brother and, and others that I felt like, uh, okay, I didn't fail you today. you know. And, and it came to a point to where it was too bad. Uh, we started the gang there was about about 20 of us that all grew up together we played little league together we did everything and and we just kind of banded together and said uh you know we're gonna really take over take over the town well uh, a gang came from san francisco 
these guys, they traveled in packs at the time. Probably one of the biggest gangs that I had seen. 20 car loads, maybe 10 in each car. They were in the hundreds. So they came to our school in our city and we were there. It started actually over a cousin of mine when this guy tried to punk him. Uh, I was already kind of messing up and I said, okay, well, that's the wrong person. And so I, I'm gonna bring everything that I have. We ran into him. We, you know, first it started out with a fight, maybe three on three, then it was five on five. They start shooting. They had a lot of guns. We had a lot of guns too. It was to a point you you would hear bullets. Like that's the closest that I know that I had came. Uh, bullets would fly. You know, you hear zzz, like literally zzz, right past your head. So uh, a lot of people got shot, both sides, and. A lot of people got hurt. That was just the beginning. We had a couple of friends who they ended up catching murder cases early, 15, 16. That puts you on the map, realistically. Well, we had guys, they were going to prison for murder, and people were dying on both sides. The gang continued to grow. We gained a lot of power to the point to where when we were really, really strong, there was about at least 350. I got 300 motherfuckers. I'm marching them. We're marching down streets. I got them in the neighborhood. S, 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 S. That's South Side Stock. And they're loud as fuck. And it's rolling. And we got guns in the back. Got guns in the middle. No guns in the front. They're going to run if the cops come. But as they're marching, they're really enthused about this. They're really embracing this. You know, is this is their family, and we were like a family. And they weren't all from the South Side. They just kind of gravitated towards what we were doing. We took on every side of town because we that's how we felt. Matter of fact, actually, I didn't like East Side before I even knew what the East Side was because that's what I was told. East Side's your enemy. Southerners are your enemy. You know, uh, West Side, not so much. I hated them before I met. And we went against them. But having that many people, it was not hard. Every shooting is related in every way. Because for us, which is no different than anybody else, if we had to bury somebody that night while we were crying, and we cried, and we drank, and we got the guns together, and we decided who we thought it was, uh, we'd say, okay, well, we're going to look for them. If they were smart, they weren't on the street anymore. Anyways, so what's next? We go to every neighborhood that is alive. If you, if I'm looking for you, but you're not there, I'm hurt. Hurt people hurt people. We're shooting somebody tonight. That's why I say everything is related. There is no unrelated action. They'll say, well, no, you know, the guy died here. We know they're fighting with them, but you killed someone over here on this other side. There's no relation. Yeah, there is. We were out. We sent everybody everywhere. We were looking for people. More people kept dying, more friends. And what happened was I had a friend, his name was Fernando Valles. Dangerous. He was not dangerous when I knew him when we were little. You know, we played baseball together. He changed. And uh, he got murdered. We believe it was a setup. Yeah, that changed me a lot because we were really close. We were, we were like, brothers but brothers with an understanding which was if something happened to you it's gonna get ugly I was already not a nice person I was already hurting a lot of people and a lot of my friends were already murdering at this time I had not murdered so I'm thinking I got to keep up with these Joneses right here we'd be sitting on the table and I'm looking around and I'm like There's five fucking murderers right here and they're looking up to me right now and although I've shot to kill I mean I've shot quite a few people and you know I had intentions of killing them but to that point I had not and I could see some of them changing some of them changing for the worse lack of a better term like monsters in a sense like they became so callous and when Fernando died I went to the front I'm taking over everything this is it and they were fine with that because I have, uh, God bless me. I used it in bad ways at the time, 
but he gave me a gift and the gift was to talk and persuade. I'd meet their needs. I'd give them hopes, promises. I'm pushing it hard. I will say there was a high. And what I mean by high, um, the power. Uh, so I end up catching a life sentence. I'm supposed to go get some money. You know, it was a vendetta. But I, I have to say that when, before I shot the man that I shot, it wasn't about nobody else but me. I said to myself, you're a bitch if you walk out of here without shooting that man. That's how I felt. Remember, I'm keeping up with the Joneses. These guys have already done so many murders. And I'm thinking, you're a bitch if you walk out of here without shooting that dude. I could not have lived with myself if I had not shot him. And as soon as I made the decision, I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna kill this man. I just, I walked up to him, shot, shot him uh, five times. I heard something. I thought that somebody was moving. So I leaned over, I shot him four more times. As he laid on the ground, uh, you know, he was shot seven times, a nine millimeter. I didn't care. I heard they were drug dealers. I heard that they were doing a lot. So I, I was more concerned uh, that they were going to come find me. Uh, not that the SWAT team would be kicking down my door. And that's what happened 11 days later. So I end up going to trial, and I denied it all the way to the end. Thank God the guy didn't die, but he was paralyzed. I, I had homicide detectives. They had me as a suspect in a few things, and I think that's a part of why I got so much time, was because they were like, well, no, we got you for this. We're going to take you to the full extent. You've been around too long. You've been doing too many things. Lou was sentenced to 23 years to life for attempted first-degree murder, plus gun and assault charges. It would be more than two decades before he'd get to stand before a parole board, but with a mentality like his, Lou's chance of getting out was slim to none. I was thinking, well, shit, I'm not ever going to get out. You send me with 20 years, I'm going to kill somebody in prison. That's how it is. So if you give me more than 10, I'm not getting out anyways. So it's all or nothing. So that's why I went to trial, because that was my mentality. Well, I'm not ever going to get out anyways. Who am I going to have to hurt? I believed in it at the time. I was like, yeah, you know what? The, I believe in the cause. You know, let's protect each other and the strongest man and, you know, all that. So I started getting trained, started getting indoctrinated. I started to go to the hole a lot. And now it's getting to the point to where you're trained to use weapons. So I started to do that. Was I coerced? I would say no. I would say that became my life. I would say I didn't think I was ever getting out of prison. And, and, and I had, I don't want to say I came to terms with that. I never came to terms with never getting out of prison, but I came to terms with that I had fucked up enough that the system, the society, they said, we're through with you. I wanted this power and I wanted this life and I wanted to have this reputation as this kind of person. And this was the end result. Now I had to pay for it. And, and I believe that. Tried to leave my wife. She got mad. I was like, no, I, we're not married. Uh, I'm, this is my life here, you know. And as I believed that that's what was happening, I started a new career from instead of street gang to prison gang. And I had some men that were very uh, charismatic that were teaching me and training me. And I felt that it was a necessary evil for me because uh, I was scared for my life. Scared for my life. Did we have weapons? Absolutely. I was less scared if I had a weapon, but I was scared and people were trying to kill me. You know, there was other groups that were just as fucking nuts as us and they're trying to kill me and I'm trying to kill them. So that was like, well, I need the training. I need it to be better, to, to be the best that I could be at this. And I found myself validated because of some of the things that I had done on different yards. Got put in the hole with a ticket to Pelican Bay. Shit. 
In California prisons, inmates are validated as prison gang members if detectives decide they meet certain criteria. Some men even admit they're gang members. And once they're validated, they're sent to a remote, ultra-high security prison like Pelican Bay near the Oregon border. Prison gang members and their highest leaders are held in what's called the SHU, the Security Housing Unit. They're locked down 23 hours a day. They eat in their cells, and they're shackled in chains whenever they're taken to the doctor or for a visit behind glass or to the law library. The only physical human contact they have is with guards and cellmates. To some prison gang members graduating to the SHU, and especially its infamous short corridor where the leaders are held, is considered a major career step. They may be isolated, but it's here that the work of the prison gangs takes place. My brother was already there, so he pulled me into his cell, which was cool. I had not seen him in many years. And he was getting out, actually, within a year of that time, so we had celled up. And there was a lot of, a lot of uh, gang members there that were very high up. And they started just giving me everything that they had because they were leaving. When I say everything they had, whatever knowledge they had, they were going to give me whatever from to establish a main line, weapons, indoctrination, what books to read, what laws to study, or, you know. So it started to get hard because the people who were training me, they all had got indicted and they all went to the feds. Mostly all the top went to the feds. And when they left, now I'm going on probably six years in the shoe. They had given me a lot, a lot of education from every angle to where if I was sent to a prison, if I was put in any area, it would be easy to take it over effectively. That's what they train you to do. But I would also have the power to do it because of them. So when they left, a lot of power fell in my plate. As that's happening, I'm sitting there, going on 10 years now in the shoe. You know, it's Groundhog Day. Every day is the same. I had men next to me that were sworn enemies that if the door cracked, I would try to kill them. But we were the best of friends. With the door shut, they were good people. We share food. I get food, you get food. It's business, you know, and they knew it and I knew it. So I liked a lot of them more than I even liked some of my own friends. Now we're going on 11 years. They call a war with the cops, which is very strange. When Lou says cops, he means prison guards, correctional officers. As his gang's attacks against the cops escalated, the officers retaliated with their own form of guerrilla warfare, shoving the inmates around, tripping them, letting them fall while being transported. Normally, North does not go against the police. They normally don't. The people who left, they would have not done that. They even used to teach us that. Be kind, be courteous, be respectful. We call it a false sense of rapport. We don't want them in our houses. We don't want them in our spots. You know, be kind, courtesy. We're all human. You get a lot through that, or at least left alone. So now we're going against the cops. They started kind of manhandling us a little bit. People are falling. They're falling face first. It's part of the game. All right, we're, we're going at each other now. You know, we've already made attempts on them. So I'm going to medical. The only reason why I'm going to medical is to obtain information. There's nothing wrong with me. I just want to walk. I have a white shirt, white boxers, black bubble gum. They're not Converse, but they look like Converse. Shackled at the waist. Got two cops. They always have two correction officers walking with you at all times with batons out. So I'm walking through. And as we're walking, I look down and I see... My shoe is untied, and it's a long shoestring. It's they're really long shoestrings. And so I'm thinking, fuck, you know, great. My training, everything that I know, it's a security risk for me because now they have a reason. It's easy for me to go down somehow and not land well. And so I'm thinking, all right, let me just keep my feet as far. I can't move them too far because they're shackled. Keep my feet as far as they can away so I can get to a cage so I can tie my shoe. It's a long haul, walking, walking. I'm trying to keep my eye on my foot, watching the two seals, one on each side. We get maybe halfway to medical, and as we're walking towards the middle, uh, I see this correction officer come around the corner. I'd seen him many times, big, corn-fed white boy. I took him as a man's man. He was a tough guy for them. I could see that. You know, he would, like, kind of bark at them as well. So I see him come around the corner, and I'm still walking, and usually they put you on the wall so that they could safely pass. 
and we're walking. And I'm waiting for them to put me on the wall, but I'm also still looking at my shoe. And as the correctional officer is coming, we come to a dead stop. And as soon as we stop, I look, I see that the, the big white officer, uh, he's beeline to me, like came across into our lane, which they're not supposed to do that. As soon as he came into our lane, he drops down to one knee and he grabs my foot and he starts to tie my shoe. And I'm leaning over him and I'm shackled and I, you know, I got my hands down like this and I'm looking at him and he's not looking up at me. He's just tying my shoe. He's doing bunny knots, you know, like my grandma. My grandma used to give me bunny knots and I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, motherfucker, don't tie my shoe. Don't tie my shoe. We're enemies. I can't speak it. That's all I'm thinking. We're enemies. And he ties it and he gets up and he just turns around. He walks away. Never says a word. And as he's walking away, I'm looking at him and I grew up Catholic. And I say, for the first time, I say, I don't know what a Christian is, but I think that's one. That's the first thought that I have. I think that's one. That's the only way for me to interpret what he had done. And he humbled me in a way that uh, he didn't break my glass ceiling of insanity all the way, but he cracked it. He had put a nice, ugly crack in my insanity. And as he was walking away and I said to myself, this is a man's man, he's a tough guy. These two guys, these fucking idiots, I've been walking with them and I'm afraid they're gonna trip me and bust my face, which rightfully so, we're, we're not friends right now. He did something in, his, in front of his peers that was unacceptable. It was counterproductive for him to do what he did at that moment for me. And that never left me what he had done. And I didn't know why he did it. Never talked to him before and never talked to him since. And I was humbled by my thoughts of, I didn't deserve this, you know? Why, why did you do that to me? And I was upset, actually. And I was like, fucking motherfucker, tie my shoe like that. And when they had took me back and I went back to my cell and I sat there and I kept thinking about it, it was humbling to the point of, I would say it was like he had uh, humanity in him and he reached out and, he, and he, when he touched my hand, he gave me some humanity. That's the best way I could say it. And that shit never left, you know? And so now I'm looking from a lens of a little bit of empathy. He cared for me when I didn't care about me. He cared about me when I didn't care about him. And I don't know what his reasoning was, but when he did that, and I was a little bit older and I had a little bit more education in, in my mind and in my heart, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about that. I started to watch a victim awareness video in the shoe. And I watched the video. There was a lot of different stories of different people that were victimized, but there was a lady that stuck out to me that was robbed. It stood out to me because I did a lot of robberies. I robbed at gunpoint. I prefer to rob at gunpoint because I'm in control. Yeah, when I say rob, I'm talking home evasions. You know, it, we're coming in. And she said how it affected her after it had already been done. Months had happened already and, oh, I feel this way and I'm scared and I can't. And I had never once thought about how anybody felt, really. I mean, that wasn't my care or concern. And to hear her talk about how it affected her much after, uh, it made me think of the women in my life that I cared about. And there was a connection there and I started to say, well, fuck, you know, I, I was fucking up. They're probably still hurt. Now, as this woman's saying, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are feeling that way. That was another crack. Another swing at, at that glass ceiling of insanity. So I'm sitting there. Time is going. My children coming to visit me. You know, they sell mugs. They sell shirts. Souvenirs. For anybody who visits Pelican Bay, and the souvenirs say, welcome to Pelican Bay, home of the worst of the worst. And my, my children are very young at the time. 
And my son comes, obviously I'm shackled. Well, they take them off when you get there, but they see that you're shackled. And he says, uh, first question, are you the worst of the worst? And I said, why do you say that? I did not know. He said, well, because there's a sign that says the worst of the worst. And I said, what am I to you? I don't know. What am I to you? And he said, you're my dad. And when he had told me that, it stopped me for a second because I wanted to be the worst of the worst. That was my goal for a long time. And the reality of it was, had it been somebody else that asked me that question, I would have took pride in saying, I'm, I'm pretty close. You know, I'm up there. But coming from this young man, you know, a boy, I was like, that's nothing to gloat about to you. There's another break of that glass ceiling. My grandmother died when I was in the shoe. My nana died when I was in the shoe. My uncle and my aunts. And they bring you and they put you in a chair and they hand you a phone. You're still shackled. Seals on both sides. Call your house. We have a conversation. That's are you all right and all that. When my grandmother passed, I didn't really cry at the moment. But when I went to the yard, uh, I felt like I got uh, like, you know, when you when you spank someone and, and they yelp like a like a scary yelp. I'm out on the yard, I think about my grandmother, and I yelp. And the yelp scares me. That's how loud it is. And I start to cry because I miss her. You know, I've lost my grandmother. And so I'm like, what the, that shit scared me. I'm like, damn, where'd that come from? You know, it's like a little kid that got spanked. There's another, and so I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm living a dual life. I have these thoughts, I have these feelings. I'm teaching people things now that I don't believe. Yes, you have to hurt your dad if he's not with us. You have to hurt your brother if he says something against us or if his paperwork doesn't check out, whatever it is. And I'm saying this, but I'm not believing it. There was a time I believed it at my core. And I'm sitting there, and here comes this thought. Leave the gang. Scariest thought. I said to myself, you fucked up. You fucked up. You are never to have a thought like that in your life, ever. You were never to ever have a thought like, I would have probably had you killed, had you would have told me some shit like that just prior to. I know that, because I know where that leads. So when I said to myself, you gotta step away from this, it was over. I said, oh, they're gonna know. I, I, I can't be here no more. And it was not, it was no other reason other than because I had a thought. For me, that thought was worse than the action. I had mortal, fatal sin because everything for me was based on belief. Everything for me was based on faith. Everything for me was based on my loyalty and my commitment to what I was doing. So I had thought that and I said, I'm done. I, I, went, I went too far with a thought. I'm thinking they could see it in my eyes. I'm thinking it says on my forehead, you thought about leaving. I knew that thought was everything. And so I said, okay, I got to go. I got to leave. I don't know how I'm going to leave. I got sick because I was changing everything that I ever thought of, you know, that I wanted to be in my life. Well, that's the only thing I was good at. I was a leader. And now I'm not even good at that. I got real sick. Identity, crisis, everything. It was all bad. I started to lose weight really losing weight. Here comes the question, you know, what's wrong with you? Because obviously you can see into everybody's cell in Pelican Bay, it's open, it's wide open. They're like, hey, are you all right? And I said, oh yeah, well, I got a visit. You know, my, my ex-wife is coming. I want to, you know, look good. And they're like, how thin are you going to get? I said, oh yeah, I'm really done. They're seeing this, this stress on my mind. Wrote, wrote this long ass manifesto, which it was just said, I'm done. Come and get me when you can. My life's not in danger. Don't pull me out to see a psychiatrist. Don't pull me out to see a counselor. We all know what that means. That means something's wrong. So I said, don't do none of that. When you get a time and a space for me, come and get me. This is not a joke. And I'm carrying it around for like a week. I said to myself, God, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play craps with you. I'm gonna write down two, two things, yes and no. I'm going to shake it up in a bag. And if it's yes, I'm leaving. If it's no, I'm staying. Shook the bag. Stuck my hand in and said, yes, go. And my decision was done. 
I walked up to the front to get some soap, threw that note underneath. The cop looked at me. He had been there for like seven years. We were really close. He looked at me like, what the fuck is that? Like, I don't, I don't see that. I turned around. I walked away. And I knew I was, it was done then. I'm, I'm really done. I said, okay, I don't know how this is going to play out, but it's over now. Now I, I actually talked to them. You know, had not talked to them my whole life. And 10 minutes later, my door opens. And they say, hey, you graduated. He, out of care and concern for me, said I was graduating to the shore corridor. They were taking all the top guys. Everyone believed it because I was already there for so long and doing what I was doing. And he goes, you graduated. I knew where I was going. I was like, damn, that's 10 minutes. What the fuck is that? I came in. I looked at one friend of mine that had been there for about eight years, uh, loved him, love him. And I looked him in his eyes, as, tried to tell him through my story, through his, my eyes, I'm gone, it's done, come with me. You know, he looked, it looked like he caught it. He just shook his head, grabbed my stuff, took off. I went in, I talked to uh, the guy, said, How, why did it happen so fast? They said, man, when we told them it was you, they were like, get that motherfucker. Get him now. Lou left the gang and the shoe for good and was moved to a protective custody yard. He served another five years before facing the parole board. The people on the parole board are not pushovers, but in five years, Lou had made so many changes. He became a peer mentor who helped other inmates undo their criminal ways that the unheard of happened. He was granted parole his very first time up. After 21 years in prison, Lou was a free man. Most importantly, he was a changed man. Fast forward, what I do with gang diversion, things I say now that could get me killed. There's people who don't want to hear the story. You know, there's people who uh, follow the code still, and that's understandable. You know, that man, he did something in front of his peers when he tied my shoe. I said, well, I'm going to do something in front of my peers that might not be acceptable, that might not be appreciated, but that maybe the young kids have to hear. My thinking is, is I was willing to die over some dumb shit. I'm willing to, to risk my life over something positive. It's not a gang problem. It's a character defect problem that the culture is just based on all those character defects that were handed down to our children, that, that we need to heal them because hurt people hurt people and healed people should heal people. You know, my thinking is there was someone I wanted to be and I became that. And I became that because I think a lot of the self-esteem issues and the character defects that I had early on and the lack of men that were in my lives or at least good role models. Today, for me, I see a man with all the tattoos and some of them I say, that's an OG. I look at him, I say, that's probably the hurtest guy here. I feel sorry for him. You're the hurtest dude here, man. You're, you're a child. You're a child in a man's body, and you're doing some really violent things, but you're doing them because hurt people hurt people. Does it justify it? No. That's why we have consequences. At least let's tell the truth. You ain't got to make the same decisions I made, but interestingly enough, and I could say this in all honesty, I, I was that guy you want to be, you know? I was that guy. I was the leader, and... We weren't a ragtag group. We were a very serious gang. Hurt a lot of people. Many, they're still indicting them. You really do have it in you. But whether you do or don't, don't tell it to the kids. I don't care how you live your life. That's for you to live. But don't tell a little kid that because he's listening to you. He's trying to pay attention to everything you're saying. He's dressing the way you're dressing. He's following your every move. I have grandchildren. They follow my every move. You know, one in particular. And I'll be damned if I tell them about that. And so I say, well, for the children, real men cry. Real men are loyal to one woman. Real men don't run in packs. The gang is still going strong. Um, there's a lot of people that lost their lives I feel responsible for because that's all they wanted was to be like me. And... There's people now that are probably still living to be like some of the men that came after me. And if there's anything that we could do to say, you know, let's find a new truth 
and the truth is just understand you're hurt. That's it. Just admit that. Admit that you're hurt. And then let's take a look maybe at something deeper. Can't correct what you can't identify. So if you're hurt, let's start there. I hurt a lot of people. They make us do work to get out of prison. And the work is on yourself to understand why you got to where you got to. But I believe that out here in the community, you could take your remorse and you could birth it like a birth mother into empathy. And then you could bring that empathy and you could turn it into action. So although I don't have the same level of remorse that I had when I was working on myself in prison, uh, I do have an equal or greater amount of empathy and action that justifies that the remorse is there. It's just in a different way. It's living in a different body. Um, the blessing is to be out. When I had first got out, when I say got out, I mean out of uh, the shoe. And we were in a group with a lot of dropouts from all different gangs. And obviously they put us together to see if we would attack each other, just to see if this was real. The question was, tell me who you are in five minutes. But you can't say you're a father, you're a brother, you're a son. You are all those things, but you can't say that because it's superficial. It's something that you already know. Now remember, I had just taken the mask of, of, of madness off and cracked this ceiling of insanity. And so I could not say I was any type of gang member. And that was really what my whole belief system and career and identity was based on. I couldn't say that because I'm not that. So I'm standing up in front of probably about 10 men and I look at them and I'm thinking, I want to have this answer. I want to give them this answer. And I start to cry. And tears are coming down because I tell them, I don't know. I don't know who I am. Being that I'm not a gang member anymore, I can't use that. And so I sit there and I'm crying and I walk away. About three years later, I come back to myself and I come back to that question and I have the real answer. And my new answer became, I do know. I always knew. I never forgot. I just didn't have the ability to protect him. I don't like hurting people. I love blue. I love children. I love God. I love my family. I'm compassionate, kind, courteous. And I like to laugh. And I enjoy crying when it's for people I care about. And that's something that I always knew. But because I was not healthy enough, I could not let you know that. I could not let you know that. No, I don't cry. I am violent. And I think that even us as children, as they go through adolescence or become young men and women, they know it's just they, the ones who fall into the gang life. They just don't have the ability to protect that person. So now they're wearing all this makeup or they have all these tattoos and they have this mask and they're everything who they know they're not know exactly that they're not but because I care more about what you think about me than I do about what I think about myself I'm gonna be everything you need me to be and nothing of what I am Today, Lou works for the city of San Francisco. He's a supervisor of a team of former felons who keep peace on the streets. If you ever see them in action, their work is amazing. If someone's passed out on the sidewalk, they'll get help. People are fighting on the streets, they intervene. I watched the team skillfully break up a fight that could have ended with someone in jail or a hospital. Seeing Lou calm those two women down, gracefully holding a space between them until they let off steam, I realized Far from being a threat to society, I felt safer knowing Lou was in my city. I think a lot of times we give up on people like Lou. We think the best we can do is shut them away forever. And yeah, as individuals, sometimes that's necessary. But as a society, Lou makes me believe we can do better. It's all too easy to say, you blew your chance, you crossed the line and we're done. We could have done that with Lou, and we almost did. But all that changed with an untied shoe and a gesture of kindness when it was least expected. Lou took it from there, and he spent years doing a lot of hard work on himself. 
We live in polarized times when many of us assume that the people around us are either on our team or the other side and that no one will change. But getting to know Lou and seeing the work he does in our community, his dedication to his neighborhood now, I know that people can change. And if Lou can find hope for the future, then so can we. And so I'm everything that I had just told you. And I'm blessed to understand that. I'm a child of the Most High God, and I just stay focused on that, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. That's who I am. Thank you. You can find more episodes and read our show notes at voicesofmontereybay.org slash gray area. That's G-R-A-Y. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It's now called Apple Podcasts. That helps more people find us. Today's music is by Audio Binger, Blue Dot Sessions, Ryan Little, Ketza, and Komiku, with special thanks, as always, to the Free Music Archive. This episode was co-produced by Mara Reynolds. I'm Julie Reynolds-Martinez. 